Um, and as I said, I'm Sarah Lipscomb, the director of the All America City Award Program here, and I'm joined with my colleague uh, Rebecca Trout as well. And the National Civic League is a nonprofit. We've been around for almost 125 years, and we work to advance civic engagement to create equitable, thriving communities. And one of the ways we do that is through our flagship program, the All America City Award. Um, and so each year we recognize 10 communities for exceptional civic engagement that um, solve their local complex problems. And obviously mental health is an issue that many communities are addressing around the country. And so we were very glad to have the 2018 winning communities of Longmont, Colorado and Stockton, California submit projects in their 2018 application that address the issues of mental health um, by using civic engagement. <clears throat> um, next. So before I um, introduce the Longmont presenters, I do just want to briefly touch on the 2019 awards um, for those of you who are interested in the program. Um, we are highlighting creating healthy communities through inclusive civic engagement for the coming year. Um, so we're really looking for projects that use community decision making processes to create healthy communities, especially for those um, who are experiencing poor health outcomes. So health equity is very important for this upcoming year. And you can go on our website to download the application. Um, it is not due until March 6th, but there is a letter of intent that is coming due um, in about a month. And um, all of our information is on the website, including my contact information will be in the follow up email if you all are interested in learning more about the program. Uh, so with that, I'd like to go ahead and get started with our first presenters um, from Longmont, Colorado. We have Julie Phillips, who is the project coordinator for supporting action for mental health. Then we also have Karen Rooney, who is the community services director at the city of Longmont. Julie and Karen. Good morning. We're just getting our slideshow started here. Fabulous. So thank you for inviting us to be part of this webinar. And we were absolutely honored to be recognized as one of the um, 2018 All-American Cities for our work in Longmont. And we're particularly proud of our work on um, supporting Action for Mental Health. So my name is Karen Rowney, and um, I'm the Community Services Director for the city, and I'm going to start our, um, our presentation here. And um, so, so basically, what Supporting Action for Mental Health is, it really is a, a community initiative that we uh, established to try to help build um, more community support, community awareness, uh, to take action to address uh, the mental health needs in, um, in our, our community. And the, the catalyst, actually we've been working on mental health issues on a community-wide basis for, um, you know, for many years, but I think the catalyst for us forming the um, SAM, as we call it, was we had um, um, two pretty horrific incidents that happened um, in Longmont back-to-back um, -back that just really kind of, um, I think, jarred the whole community and really became a, a call to action that, that we wanted to do something different um, in, in our community to make sure that, that anyone in, in Lamont who is struggling with uh, mental health issues is that they were um, no longer alone, that they felt supported, and they felt like as a community that we would really work together to help make sure that people could uh, get the help that they need if they were um, experiencing a, a, you know, a, a tragedy. So we didn't want people to get to the, the point where like we had a, a murder-suicide um, and then a couple of days later we had um, a, a fetal abduction that made national news and we just didn't want to have people in our community feel like they're was no hope and that things just really spiraled out of control before they really could get the assistance that they, that they needed. So what we ended up doing here in Longmont is after those tragedies happened, we um, had a, a call to action. We invited the community to come to a large gathering to debrief what happened and to really talk about what 
you know, what's next for us? And so what we had about um, 75 people that signed up to help figure out what our next steps were. And over the course of, of several months, we figured out that what we wanted to do is to at, at least begin to have more community conversations um, with the, uh, inviting the entire community to be a, a part of that and to really figure out what do we think we need as a community to do to address um, mental health and to help support people who are struggling with mental health in our community. So the city of Longmont, we, we took the lead in, in convening these conversations. We trained over 15 volunteers to facilitate the, the conversations. And one of the things that was really helpful is that the city of Longmont for probably the past 20 years has had a pretty robust uh, community engagement effort as part of the city organization. So we were able to tap into um, probably half of those volunteers were already city employees who volunteered to help be a part of this effort. And these were public works employees. These were um, our Lamont Power and Communication employees. They were employees from all of our, our various departments that even though working on mental health issues isn't part of their daily jobs, it's, it, it's kind of a value here in Longmont that we all, we all figure out how we can work together when there is a challenging community need. So, so we had Longmont employees, we had volunteers from throughout the community, and the city provided training for those facilitators to facilitate the conversations. We used the, um, the SAMHSA, they had a, a community conversation guide, and Colorado Springs had also used a similar guide, and so we, we basically looked for um, efforts that were out there that we could customize for Longmont's conversation. The other thing that we did is that we wanted to focus on um, certainly recognize some of the struggles that we were having in the community, but we really wanted to focus on a positive future. So what did we want the future to look like um, in Longmont if we really were supporting people with mental health issues? So we used what we call an appreciative inquiry approach as part of our conversations. And we ended up holding um, 10 conversations with more than 250 people to, you know, really help us decide what it is as a community that we wanted to do to support um, more positive mental health in, in Longmont. So the purpose of, our, of the conversations was, you know, really for all different kinds of sectors and the community to come together and really have a meaningful dialogue about, about mental health. We wanted to help um, increase each other's understanding about the mental health issues in our community from their different perspectives. We also wanted to continue to work on reducing the stigma and mis misconceptions around um, mental health, identify some of the needs from um, in, in our community, and to start to, to generate ideas about how we address the mental health needs. And I think, um, you know, more importantly is that you know, what we know is that when there are complex community issues in the community, local governments only have so much that we can do to really work on solutions. So we felt like this was um, an incredible opportunity to invite the entire community together and to look at what everyone in the community can do. We all have a part. And so we wanted to uh, identify actions that residents as individuals, small groups, maybe neighborhood groups, as well as larger community um, strategies, what all of us could do to, to take one step toward, um, you know, helping to make sure that people are supported in our community um, when they are experiencing some kind of a, a mental health issue. The conversations were, um, they were not complex. We really asked um, three simple but very powerful questions. Um, we basically asked people, how does mental health um, impact you um, as a community member? We asked them to think about when the community is at its best in supporting members who are struggling with mental health issues, what would it look like? And then what did people think the challenges or opportunities we should be exploring 
in order to um, in order to make Longmont a, a a more caring and supportive place for people who are struggling with mental health issues. So the questions that we asked were simple, but they really were fateful in us moving forward with the actions that we decided to take. So we we had pages and pages and pages, hundreds of different ideas for what should Lamont do. And we uh, called people back together to an action forum. We probably had about 100 people show up for the action forum. And we used a computer-aided polling, which we call Option Power, and, and went through a series of, of um, ideas that people voted on to really come up with our really top two priorities that we wanted to take as a community to, um, to address uh, mental health issues, people struggling with mental health in our, our community. So um, our, our planning group, they went through all of the various ideas. They organized those ideas into to themes and, and, um, and some of the priority ideas that came out of the conversations. And we went through the option power exercise and basically identified you know, two different um, areas that we were going to focus on so, um, so, and to decide what we were going to do together that would address the mental health needs in, um, in our community. And so it was community education and crisis, access to crisis services were the two priority areas that we um, identified through the Option Power exercise. We then organized again some of the community members into those two areas to start planning action for how we were going to um, approach our work. And, um, and we were able to, with the, with the education area, it was uh, kind of serendipitous is that we had uh, the Colorado Health Foundation um, that's here in Colorado that was, um, was also had recently re released a, a grant um, proposal about how to connect communities with care, and they had heard about our uh, work in Longmont and invited us to submit a proposal, which we were very fortunate to receive. So we had $200,000 in seed money for us to, to launch our community education effort for supporting action for mental health. And what was um, also very fortunate is that we were able with those with those grant dollars to hire a, um, um, a project coordinator and her name is Julie Phillips and she's right here beside me and I'm going to uh, invite Julie to talk about the work that we have done in the whole realm of community education. So the goals that we have um, focused on over the past two years um, in education, we have been working towards training 2,000 people um, in mental health first aid here in Longmont. Mental health first aid is an eight-hour training that equips individuals to um, be able to identify um, warning signs, um, risk factors for individuals struggling with mental health, and be able to respond in a crisis. It is a training really designed for everybody, just like first aid and CPR. We also wanted to continue those conversations um, continue engaging uh, community members and talking about mental health. Um, and so we have been working towards engaging another 1,500 uh, people in that work. And then in order to, to address stigma, we wanted to have a campaign to run an awareness campaign about mental health. And we were fortunate enough to have seven counties along the Front Range area here in Colorado that were launching a campaign called Let's Talk at the same time. So we've been able to participate in that. Our crisis team has been focusing on um, the crisis resources in the community and being able to direct people to know um, where to go in a crisis and what resources we do have in Longmont. Um, they've been spending a lot of time discussing post-crisis support. Um, it's a, a gap we have in the community and how we can explore the use of uh, in-person navigators to provide that support to individuals after a crisis. And we also have been discussing ways that we can create a circle of community support, utilizing peer support, counselors, and community members um, to, to really come around and support individuals um, experiencing a mental health crisis. So 
to date, um, with the mental health first aid work we've been doing, um, we have trained nearly 1,700 people in our community in mental health first aid. Um, an important part of being able to accomplish this work and, and a part of what's been very valuable for our community is that we had the funds to not only train the participants, but train the instructors who've been teaching the classes. And we found that it's been really important to have trusted community members uh, that are providing these trainings. It is, um, it's an intense class and there's a lot of, uh, there's just a lot of material covered, a lot that um, taps into people's own experiences and so having individuals that are trusted members of our community have been an important part of that. We've also been able to offer a variety of uh, the different mental health first aid modules that are available and so not only have we been offering uh, the classes uh, that focus on adult and youth mental health, we have been offering those classes in Spanish as well. We've trained uh, nearly half a dozen bilingual, bicultural individuals um, from our community to do that and we've also been able to focus on areas of older adults, higher education and public safety. Um, we have seen individuals from all across all sectors uh, take this class. We have had nonprofits host it for their staff. We've had faith communities open up their space and uh, offer trainings for their members and for community members. And an important part of this work for us is how do we continue to engage with the folks who've taken training. And so we've been following up with participants um, first to know how they're using their skills and it's been uh, significant for us to see that in some of the skills that are taught in the class up to 95% of participants are utilizing those skills out in the community. Um, and our, our next step that we're taking is circling back to all of those uh, participants to see how else they want to be involved and to be able to continue to engage those community members in offering support and continued education um, and in other ways to be involved in mental health work in Longmont. For the community conversations, we really wanted to make them accessible and easy for community members to participate in. And so one of our teams worked on creating a series of conversation guides. And the idea was that any community group could download a conversation guide and have the tools they needed to host that conversation. It didn't require a formal setting or a facilitator. It was something we wanted book clubs and faith communities and coffee groups to be able to incorporate into, uh, into the time that they spent together. And so we have um, a number of different conversation guides. Those guides um, have been developed in both English and Spanish. And we have also gone out and helped with convening conversations when, when requested, but we've had groups do this on their own. Um, and even things like rotary groups that typically don't um, have these kinds of conversations around the lunch table um, came together. We had a group of nearly 100 that did this and uh, were really uncertain about the idea of, of having a conversation about mental health. And we, we brought the guides, we invited them to participate in these conversations, and at the end of 25 minutes we had folks sharing with us that it was some of the most significant, meaningful time they'd had in Rotary, that they knew more about the people across the lunch table than in 25 minutes than they did in months or years of coming to Rotary. And another way that we wanted to engage the community members um, was through conversations around books and films. And our library already has a series of what they call experience bags, where uh, folks can come to the library and check out a bag with books, films, other hands-on or experiential type materials. And so we partnered with them to create two mental health or well-being bags focused on mental health. One with content that was family friendly, including films like Inside Out and even children's books that uh, address anxiety. And then another bag focused on content that was uh, adult uh, focused um, with questions and conversation material so that family members and friends can can come together and, again, talk about mental health, um, engage with the topic in, a, in maybe a different way. Um, so, wait, I apologize. I have our slides going the wrong way. 
Um, as I shared before, we, we did participate in an awareness campaign um, called Let's Talk, build, uh, built on a, a model that's been used across the country called the Make It Okay campaign. And for us, it's all been about action. And so as we think about what are the actions community members can take with the campaign, it was you know, sharing materials or going to the website where you can learn about just what to say when someone's struggling with their mental health. But then we took it a step further with action items. As you can see, these are some of the materials we shared, um, inviting community members to, to take additional action. Um, we've also been able to be involved in a variety of different educational opportunities. And so for us, uh, the opportunity to look for those partnerships, to look for what's already happening in the community and to come alongside and partner has been an important part of our work. And so that's been working with our, our youth center, working with faith communities, um, also providing topics that are important for the community um, to consider topics like suicide and stigma, but also topics like mental health and the human-animal connection, something that's a little bit more accessible for some folks has been important for us as well. Our crisis team um, has been able to develop a really valuable resource for our community in which they have looked at our crisis um, resources and put them into levels or categories. And so this um, demonstrates how we've been able to think about crisis in, um, in tiers, and rather than always thinking about needing to use uh, the emergency department or calling 911 in their crisis, we've been able to help the community to consider what are the resources that we can tap into um, at lower level times of crisis in order to get the care that people need. So, we just want to highlight some of the keys to success for us, what has, has allowed us to accomplish the work we've been able to do. And so Karen's going to take it from here. So as we reflect on our, um, on our work thus far, you know, what has helped us to be, um, we think, uh, very effective in this, in this effort is that, you know, first of all, we worked with the community to identify what the community needed and wanted in, um, in, in the area of, of, of mental health support. We were also, um, when we looked at forming, um, you know, our steering committee, our, our planning, our implementation committees, we really worked hard to um, involve all different sectors of our community in this work, and that has made it um, I'll, I'll just say relatively easy, though nothing is really easy, but when we were, you know, reaching out and, um, and inviting people to be involved in these activities or if we needed resources, we already had an existing network of, um, of, of, of partners because they were all part of our, our committee and our group. So um, it just really helped us to carry this work forward relatively quickly, helped us to reach our goal of being able to almost reach 2,000 people within about um, a year and a half time frame. Um, and, and we worked really hard to identify our, you know, shared values and our shared interest as we were reaching out and, um, and, and communicating. So, um, because not everyone else, you know, so mental health can be kind of a, um, a difficult topic to talk about, and some of our partners might not see what they're, um, you know, how they might be connected to this. But we really worked hard to identify those those shared um, those shared values. So we've also um, been able to, um, because we're we're a newer group, be uh, flexible and responsive to community needs. And so as as individuals, as groups have come to us asking for different types of training, different types of resources, we have been able to develop those things, uh, provide those things um, as those ha have come up. Um, early on, it, it was important for us to identify some of the barriers that we faced, and, and two in particular. One was just recognizing that there is significant stigma around mental health, and that alone is a barrier for us in reaching the community. And so naming that and working towards um, just educating the community about how important it is to talk about mental health, to make it a topic that we all want to um, learn about and embrace and um, 
it was important for us. Um, it was, has also been very important for us to make um, our materials and our work accessible to everyone in the community, and particularly thinking about uh, monolingual Spanish speakers in our community and the Latino community as a whole. Um, we've been working with a team of people in our group that are bilingual and bicultural, um, important cultural brokers in our community who have been able to um, help us develop culturally competent materials for the community, uh, to transcreate the materials that we're working with so that we are sharing a message that um, can really resonate with, with the community um, and recognize that um, that stigma is significant in, in all of our communities, but um, but we recognize particularly for for uh, the Latino community. And I think the um, the other thing that was really key to um, to our success is that um, we by having the opportunity for some funding, we were able to hire Julie and um, and really having someone be kind of the, the point person serving as the, the backbone for this, com this broad community effort makes a huge difference in being able to carry the work forward. We, had, we really have had um, hundreds of community members involved in supporting action for mental health, but it is, um, it is, it is one person's role to really wake up every day and think about, you know, what what am I going to do to make sure that we are continuing to move this initiative forward? And that was really key for us to be able to um, accomplish the things that we have um, thus far. So, in, in just you know wrapping up, just to um, talk about really what the what our role has been as a local government is that um, we we really took on and embraced our role as a convener and a facilitator as far as bringing the community together. We served as the fiscal agent for the, the grant funding, so not only did we have funding from the Colorado Health, Health Foundation, we, will, we were able to get other smaller grants. All of that made a huge difference in us being able to carry this uh, work forward, and, and, and the city certainly could take on that fiscal agent role. We tapped into, I mentioned earlier, the, um, our existing community engagement work that we already have in place for the city and the resources that we have available for that. And so that was also something that we could contribute to the, um, you know, to this effort, as well as all of the various partnerships that we have as a, as, as a local government, we also tapped into that. So the city doesn't have uh, the, the answers to everything. We don't have all the resources that were needed. So we really tried to figure out what made the most sense, what resources that we have at our disposal made the most sense to be able to bring together and support this broad-based community initiative that wanted to take action to improve mental health in Longmont. So I believe that concludes our, our Longmont Supporting Action for Mental Health story. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen and Julie, for sharing um, this great initiative with us. And um, we just really appreciate that everything that you all do is really rooted in community input. And I like how you guys really meet people where you're at. And um, I like the option of downloading um, the guide and people being able to do it on their own or have you all come out and help facilitate. I really like having that option there. We've already gotten uh, a few questions coming into the chat, um, and we are going to hold questions until after Stockton's um, portion of the presentation, but keep sending your questions into the chat to the host, and we will get to those at the end of the webinar. We are very excited to have uh, Stockton be able to join us today with their Healing Self Stockton program that is with the Stockton Trauma Recovery Center. Good Stockton, morning. are you on the line? Good morning. We're here. Great, Good wonderful. Thank you for having me. Go ahead, us. thank you. My name is Gauri Sanchez. I'm a mental health clinician as well as a Stockton Trauma Recovery um, Coordinator. And I'm Rachel Thompson. I am also a mental health clinician. I am an associate clinical social worker. I also am the main clinician here at our pilot program at an inner city El Dorado school. Uh, elementary uh, here in inner city Stockton. Yes. 
And so today we're going to um, talk about the agency as a whole, that we, we represent fathers and families of San Joaquin, and the Stockton Trauma Recovery Center is one department that is really the umbrella and the heart of, um, of the work that we do. Um, so we have this model of, as you guys can see there in the slides, childhood, parenthood, neighborhood, right? We, uh, we have this model of wanting to heal the hood, and, and that does just not mean, you know, the hood as neighborhoods, but that means childhood, parenthood, and um, even, you know, uh, motherhood and, and sisterhood. You know, we bring in all the hoods and build that community. So at Fathers, and then we, if we can move to the next slide. So at Fathers and Families San Joaquin, we have, um, can, I don't, it's not showing right, huh? Our mission? Yeah. So our mission of our Trauma Recovery Center is to really walk alongside our victims and be able to empower them and provide them with care um, that most of the times they are not uh, served. And so, again, here you go, that's better. Our mission is to stand beside all victims and survivors every step of the way to move them towards healing and resiliency and to create a better quality of life through healing, advocacy, and culture rooted practice. As an agency as a whole, we have um, the, our mission to promote cultural, spiritual, economic, and social renewal of the most vulnerable families in Stockton and the great San Joaquin Valley. And how do we do that? We, like I started off, we do have six departments in our agency. Uh, we have the elders department. So if you walk through our office, you'll see that, you know, um, we have elders getting fed in the morning, breakfast with their coffee and pastries and lunchtime, but also karaoke and dancing and really making the vibe in our, in our center um, a family, a family set, you know. Then we have the family strengthening department that really helps the formerly incarcerated um, individuals who are just coming back from from coming out and they're coming to unite with their families again. So the family strengthening really, you know, promotes that, that and to reduce recidivism rate. <coughs> and they are able to be uh, just be with the family, parenting classes, you know, um, how to advocate, civic engagement. So they have a different, a lot of different areas where parents and adults that come back can really feel empowered and feel like they're they're a part of a society that their their vote counts, that their their say counts. Uh, we also have the youth and racial justice. The youth and racial justice. We, um, of course, we have the voice of men of color work that we do. Um, they do a lot of, you know, taking the kids to um, to the park, to you know, go camping and really expose them to different situations, uh, different environments um, that they have not been exposed to, right? Um, you take they go trips to UC Davis, um, and they also learn about civic engagement, um, about their rights, and and they also learn about policies as well. Uh, the other department that we have is um, the trauma the trauma recovery center, and that's us. Uh, so our doors open in 2015. As you guys know, in Stockton, uh, there's 92 percent 92 percent of the homicide victims are boys and men of color. That means that 92 uh, percent of our families are being left, um, you know, uh, alone in a way because uh, the way the system works here in Stockton is that if you live in a in a neighborhood that's entrenched with violence, um, and you know, are so low so low socioeconomic status then usually those clients are not seen as victims. For example, we had seen, I had, an, I had a case where um, a guy got shot up in the corner and, he, and, he, and the family did not receive any victim services because for the, for in the police report, it said that you know he kind of was in there involved, standing in a corner uh, selling drugs or something like that. Or just, in that, and the guy was not, didn't even have anything on him, but it was just like the, you know, the oppression and the bias of, of him just living in that in that neighborhood, and so as the trauma recovery center, we now we are able to provide healing services to the community, being able to provide um, more, even more beyond what what Cal BCV. We're funded by Cal BCV, and so as you guys may know, Cal BCV Cal BCV has their limits of who can provide service so, and who can get service, and so at the trauma recovery center, we're a no barriers approach. So even if you have you know the the victimization happened more than three years ago, and even if you are seeing current co as perpetrated, you need healing because we believe in our in our agency. We believe that our people hurt other people, um, but it's also time to that we all have the right. You know, we all have the right for healing, um, and it shouldn't be a privilege. Healing should not be a privilege, but a, uh, but a basic need for every every individual, especially even here in Stockton where the crime rate is so high. Um, 
And so being able to provide those services to them has been for free, you know, that includes mental health services, group therapy, um, case management, and, and really empowerment. Um, yeah, actually, yesterday we just had our conference, um, and Rachel's going to talk more about the services, but I really just want to share about, you know, our, and our conference that we had last um, yesterday. Uh, the conference that we had yesterday was to, to end gun violence on the front lines to end gun violence, and it really focused on just healing and being able to release. You know, so much time, so many times our our families do not know how to heal. You know why? Because they're not exposed to um, healing services. So you want to add more to the? Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of times, what I'm hearing also from um, our black and brown families, um, the stigma of mm -hmm. mental health. Uh, we've all learned it in school. We learned it in our practice, um, but to actually see it and, and have it come out of the mouths of our clients, um, them not knowing how to heal, knowing where to go and how to heal uh, from the trauma that they see. A lot of uh, individuals um, are struggling with um, how to learn, just knowing how to talk about it, right? Um, uh, even the group of uh, eighth graders, seventh graders that I work with currently here, um, at El Dorado School in the healing room, which we have a healing room I'll talk more about, um, they're normalizing. Mm -hmm. uh, they're normalizing the state of trauma uh, and the PTSD, the levels of PTSD that they're dealing with. Um, I just had an individual come in and said, hey, uh, my dad's friend came over to the gate uh, and I just started seeing blood everywhere. Some guys walked up and just stabbed him. And I asked him, I said, well, how did you react? He said, my mom just told me to go back in the house. It was none of our business. Mm -hmm. So that level of understanding of trauma that we're dealing with um, and just helping the parents and the family understand that is not normal, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it has to come from us, and we have to have those conversations. If we go to the next slide, um, you can see... Uh, that was an actual uh, presentation mm -hmm. um, just on with some of the victims and the families that we have there. And you see that our healing altar encompasses messages, encompass pictures. Um, we believe in a culturally rooted understanding. Mm -hmm. So just even have that intent focus, right, which we know is the clinical word or usage for prayer. But just having that prayer, that meditation, mm -hmm. uh, and the understanding of that cultural um, it, that cultural uh, cultivation influences how we see our trauma and how we deal with it. If you go to the next slide, um, so we look at our mental health treatment. So we have different mental health services that we deal with: mm -hmm. uh, grief and loss counseling, marriage family therapy, group sessions extended treatment for ongoing trauma and access to psychiatric care if needed. Uh, but we also use and infuse a culturally mm -hmm. rooted healing process uh, along with Western medicine. So healing circles or restorative justice practices um, is what our Western philosophers call it, uh, have been indigenous to uh, those that have not been westernized. They've been practicing for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, and so La Cuatura, uh, yes, it's it's what cute it's culture cures, right? And so our maestros or our maestros, um, we're with the compadre network, and they have their own curriculum that we study, um, and that curriculum teaches us that uh, we have the healers, mm -hmm. we have uh, the ability to heal ourselves, but we must face our trauma, mm -hmm. right? We must talk about it and be solution focused. Not just talk about it, but be solution focused. So opportunities to engage in the community and building, um, building um, community rapport, right? Uh, to minimize those risk factors. You can go to the next slide. So our support groups. So our support groups, we have. Um, if you can go to yes, we have the women's empowerment healing circles that we do every second and fourth week of each month, and it's really to build community. Um, like Rachel was talking about the cultura, right? Our culture. Uh, if we go back down to our roots, we, you know, we would sit with our ancestors, our elders, and they would give us the, like, the wisdom, right? Are they the wisdom keepers? And so we believe in just 
sitting down with our with our mujeres, with our women, breaking bread, and really just um, you know talking from the heart, and we learn from each other. And you would be surprised at how many how many members of that group become friends, long time long friends. We also have the other Madres con Angeles, and that is um, is translated to Mothers with Angels. That group started because uh, there's a lot of unresolved homicides here in Stockton and the mothers who want to you know have hope and and want justice at the same time um, that they're healing and the way that they were able to do that is by being able to form this group that advocates and you know stand, does marches goes to you know um, to city council and you know holds the the policy makers ac accountable uh, for the things that are going on in Stockton but at the same time they are focused on their uh, on their healing because they're receiving of course grief grief uh, grief therapy uh, empowerment you know support groups and all that and the other one the the last the last picture is basically our women's empowerment healing circles, but in Spanish. Um, so it will incorporate all different things, just yes, sitting and talking, but also, um, of course, activities and worksheets. But also, we I like to infuse art therapy in there. And as you guys see that, she um, it's like the butterfly um, story and how you know we all go through stages in our life and how we can. Um, just use our struggle to really just uh, expand our wings, right? So focusing on resiliency. We can go to the next slide, please. So our case management services, uh, as you can see in the picture, uh, we take, uh, we see some of our clinicians. You also see some of our outreach workers um, and our director there. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so going back to our case management services, I thought there was a slide that was on there. Case management services includes all types of things, everything that we can do to make uh, the trauma uh, as less, right, uh, um, um, and make it possible for the family to uh, deal with uh, where they're at, right, when they incur our services. So a lot of the trauma even spans on, say your house got shot up, and you don't have the money. So say someone passed away in your home, and you don't have the money for the cleanup. We have resources. We have uh, case management services that can connect you that will go and provide cleanup services, that will provide um, services to keep your utilities on. Um, a lot of times that's traumatizing to have your pg and &E cut off while you're trying to deal with um, a, a, a victim crime, right, where either you were murdered, domestic violence happened or occurred in the home, right? So those basic essentials case management services helps with. Let's go to the next slide. <coughs> Community advocacy, this is important even in, into mental health, right? Um, a lot of times, like right now in our county, we're backed up about three months in getting a mental health assessment through mental health crisis. They're currently turning down people. Um, if you're just walking in and you're not saying that you want to actually harm yourself or you're thinking about killing yourself, they're turning people around. And so this is why Stockton Trauma Recovery Center is such um, a place that needs to be utilized and, is, and the need is so great mm -hmm. because if you've learned how to deal with your trauma, it may not necessarily that you want to harm yourself, but you might need to process what's going on with you. Uh, you definitely need to process what's going on with you just to see how you're going to get by, just to feel validated. Um, and so we provide that. And, but with that community advocacy, we talk head on about the issues that we're dealing with. Uh, you can go to the next example, one. Okay. Okay, if I may add to that, Rachel, mm -hmm. um, in the community advocacy, as you guys know, like I, I kind of briefly mentioned in the beginning that um, we're funded by CalBCB and Cal OES. Um, but CalBCB, as you guys know, has their limits. And so the community advocacy part is that we actually take our community's needs and, and put it into policy. So uh, Fathers and Families was the first author of SB 1639, which is the uh, Healing for All um, policy that just uh, got, uh, be, that became law recently. And we're really proud of that because that, that Healing for All policy talks about um, extending services to anybody who is undocumented or who is in parole or in the gang database. Um, before, before that policy was, you know, uh, turned into law, this, the people who were undocumented or in gang database, they would be rejected. 
and they cannot provide any they cannot receive any healing services and so i just wanted to add that because we really see the needs and we we help help our community to advocate for themselves what is the need because we believe in power and proximity so we can know the answers those who have lived right um in in the tragic communities of violence we should we know that we should know the answers better than anybody else that can speak for us right and so really the community advocacy is something that helps not only to heal, but to empower our participants. And as you can see, we're on the scene response. Um, so I want to briefly talk about the Trauma Recovery Center on the scene response. Uh, we talked about it briefly at, um, when we went there to talk about our services. Mm -hmm. But the trauma recovery team are first responders. When someone is shot and sucking, we are on the scene immediately um, uh, practicing our healing method. Um, and so it, it can be very traumatizing to have a body laying out there and then there is no mental health workers on the scene. Mm -hmm. So we are on the scene. Our director really believes in that, whether it be our outpatients, whether we're giving out cards, pamphlets, letting them know, coming to um, go ahead and come into our offices the next day. Let's, um, you know, take care of you, I set you up with any therapy services or anything. We are like right, right on time, right in the moment uh, type of intervention. Because if you don't catch it, mm -hmm. it can escalate. And we've seen that retaliation rates are just as high as the initial onset of, of the murder rates. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so being community focused, uh, as Gary was saying, uh, we really take from our community. We really give our community space to express themselves, um, to be heard, right? And we influence policy. You see a lot of memorials and altars. Uh, in mental health, we have to understand that that is a way that we can reach our clients, mm -hmm. and that is a way that they should be healed. So that should always be seen as a strength, right? And if you don't understand it, take the time, ask questions about it, ask questions more about it, and what it does for the person, right? Um, and um, just seeing that empowers, being in that room, you can feel it. You can feel the healing going forth. So we're very community focused and what the community needs. You can go to the next slide. So uh, previous activities, if you want to speak a little bit on that. Yeah. So uh, previous activities that we have done with our participants to really form that community, because again, it's not they won't just heal in a, in a room once a week when we're just 50 minutes, right, talking to them about the problems. We really uh, wrap around um, services with them, and we do pretty pro-social activities, right? Like so many of our families are, uh, you know, cannot even, do not even know what a fun day could look like, right? They're working too hard. They don't even, they don't have the funds to go out and enjoy their families. And so we have done, um, obviously, survivor mixers and speaker panels, Queen for a Day, and that's around Mother's Day where we pamper our, our, our survivors of crime. Um, we give them massage, makeup, hair, and everything like that. We also expose them to crime survivors, sip and paint, where they can come in and just enjoy, you know, how sip and paint now is kind of like, you know, it's kind of the famous. The new trend. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so we want to be able to give that job to our participants, you know, um, that's healing and it's art. And also we do the Thanksgiving turkey giveaway and the Christmas toys pressing giveaway because we, especially during the holidays, we know those are hard times, uh, not only emotionally, but also financially. And so we want to be able to bless our families up with that and at the same time bless ourselves with that. Um, community healing circles, and we also have courageous conversations. And the courageous conversations is where uh, we have families who, um, you know, uh, who, who are victims, and we bring in, you know, law enforcement you know, and build that community trust. Um, having those co courageous conversations, meaning really being open and honest about uh, who has hurt them, right? And knowing that sometimes it's not on purpose. And so being able to have that courageous conversation really sets the tone to, to trust and to build from it. And of course, we have healing the hood barbecues and all that, um, making sure that they feel, they feel the love because together, we all know that together we can all heal and making sure that we're united as a community. We can go to the next slide, please. Oh, there was a slide before that for the healing circles that we wanted Rachel to discuss. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what happened to that black <laughs> Go to the one after that and see if it's there. Let's go. So let's go to the next slide. Forward. Previous activities. And let's forward. Let's forward through there. Oh, that's it. So let me talk a little bit about our pilot program because you guys need to know about that. Of course, walk-ins are welcome, right? And appointments are on Monday through Friday. The, re the How we deal with the walk-ins is, of course, we're assessing for safety, right? Um, and then, if, of course, if there's some mandates that need to be done, we'll handle that within that time frame. However, um, our counseling uh, department is adjacent in another building that's parallel to our main um, um, office where we take in intakes off the street. So a lot of times um, there might have been a shooting that just occurred. Someone might have witnessed the shooting or somebody witnessed a domestic violence incident, right? The trauma happened real in real time. And sometimes they just walk off the street. This is what I'm going through. I can't process it. What's going on? I haven't been able to sleep, all of these things, right? So after we ground them, we go in there and we do an intake. Um, and after we do our intake, they can start therapy the next day if they need to, um, literally. Um, and so this is what free, um, this is what three free services looks like, right? It's right in the moment and um, it's on the go and it's and it's good stuff. The pilot program, however, the pilot program here. Um, the principal, principal Kristen Buckingham, started advocating for something different. She saw that there was a shift in um, the, the, the children and the atmosphere, the social and economic atmosphere here in Stockton. And what's going on is there's further trauma going on um, with um, – there's further trauma going on with the transitional housing situation of California. And what we're seeing is we're seeing Bay Area, I'm sorry, we're still, we're here at the pilot program now, I'm sorry. Um, we're, we're seeing transitional Bay Area housing, uh, people losing their housing and gentrification happening. And so they're coming into the inner city of Stockton where we're at, and they're coming also with their trauma, right? And so they're seeing all these different behaviors manifesting in the school. However, there is 450 students to one school counselor. And so the school counselor is being overwhelmed. She can't tap into or deal with the trauma-related issues uh, due to all of the other school-funded things that she has to get to. Um, and so Principal Buckingham practicing restorative justice practices with her staff and the students here have asked uh, for extra help. And so this is where fathers and families stepped in. We are now in this school full-time free. We're not getting paid for this. We're doing this because we believe in the community. Um, and so uh, what's going on now is the fact that, um, you know, we're having individuals with trauma, um, fathers that are being gunned down in the streets, um, mothers who you know, are currently on drugs, trying to cope with some of the trauma they're dealing with, sexual molestation cases, all these things are coming right um, out. But I perform my services in a healing room. She designated a large classroom um, and encompassed it as a healing opportunity uh, to come in. So there's no teaching being done here other than psychosocial education. Um, the, the setup here, she has a bed, a lounge chair, she has uh, comfortable cushions, and then we have a circle of, um, place where the children can come and they can just talk about what's going on with them. So I'm here right now, I have uh, 45 kids on our caseload uh, with tier three trauma instances. So whether it was either they saw something um, um, uh, direct or it was something indirect that caused them to be placed in traumatic instance. Um, and so, as you can hear, uh, I do deal with children uh, at the level of the need is very high um, here. And uh, the normalization and desensitization uh, to the trauma is real. Um, so we're on the front lines dealing with this. I'm here at El Dorado School right now. Um, uh, I have stopped my time to take time on this webinar. Um, so we appreciate your time um, and the efforts that we're doing and contributing to society. 
Um, that is our information. Um, please visit our social media website. Um, our social media website is Fathers and Families of San Joaquin. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Facebook. Um, you'll see more in-depth information, uh, what we're doing at the healing schools, what we're doing to heal the community um, through our mental health awareness and, and, and social education. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for taking the time out of your really important work to share um, what you all are doing. And I just absolutely love the healing should not be a privilege and that you all are really living by that and providing such needed services and stocked in. And we appreciate just what a strong community you all have always been. So thank you again so much. Thank you. Um, we've gotten a few questions come in on the chat. Um, so we'll go ahead and start asking those, even though I know our hour is almost over. Um, but the first one that came in was for Longmont, um, asking about specific barriers um, to the SAM program and how you overcame them with community input. Good, good question. Sorry, we're just <laughs> we're thinking. We're thinking. Um, yeah, no problem. Well, you know, as we shared, I think honestly, one of the one of the largest barriers was just the stigma of mental health itself. The the challenge of asking the community to talk about something that we generally feel uncomfortable talking about. Um, and so, I, I mean, for us, a lot of it was just continuing to to, to push the message that. You know, this is something that we want to talk about, that it is something that is important to talk about and making that accessible in a variety of different ways um, and doing that in a variety of different settings. And so that's, that's definitely one, one barrier in what, how we've overcome it. Great. Thank you. Um, for Stockton, we had a question about um, what kinds of outreach you do to make sure that people know about your services. Um, especially since they're free and finances wouldn't be a barrier. How do you guys really make sure that people uh, know about your events and know about your services? Yes, definitely. Um, what we do is, like we said, we respond to on the crime scene, right? But we go out in the community. We have neighborhood trust builders that go out and door by, knock on doors uh, on those neighborhoods that are most impacted and really just build the community, ask them, you know, can we have a minute of your time and then just go in there and talk about all the services. Um, knowing that we have services for each family member available to them. And so, you know, going into um, those communities, going into the, into the, um, also into social media and also into the radios here, you know, um, be, being able to build community like that. Um, so we do have a, a, large, a large group that are designated outreach workers to really go out there and make sure that the community members are getting the services that they need and that they know about us. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I know we are up on our hour right now, um, but any additional questions we'll be sure um, to include to our speakers. And um, in the follow-up email, everyone will receive a recording of the webinar. Um, we'll also add in um, some other resources from Longmont and Stockton. Um, and Stockton, I'll be sure to include your social media sites as well for people um, to look at. And again, we just really appreciate um, everyone joining us and for the presenters. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.